Okay, so you've heard a lot of very new stuff today. Uh, you, I hope you realize that much of what you've heard, you are the first generation to learn this. Your parents didn't know about all this stuff. But I'm going to tell you something that your parents probably did know, at least if they were in publishing or in design. And I think it's important to look back sometimes and learn from the past. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm showing you three examples. Um, and let's first say why I'm, uh, where they come from and why I'm showing you. Actually, what I'm telling you is not my invention. I'm showing you things that have been known for centuries. This is the French national printer. They give rules for how to style books. This is the Dutch national publisher, the same. And this is the Chicago Manual of Style. Well, if you can see, it's just a cover because I came by plane and the book is rather heavy. <laughs> so these are authoritative sources. They really know what they're talking about. It's been developed over centuries. How do you style text? And I think it's important to, uh, to listen to them. Because what they've discovered is these things work. People read the text styled this way and people understand what they read. They are also used, of course, to this style over the years when they learn to read and it's reinforced every time they read a new book. They see the same, uh, the same traditions, the same style. So it's important to keep to those so that people have an e easier time reading. Um, Let's look at one example. This is a way, as you open a French book with uh, dialogues in there, you see a way of quoting text. When somebody says something, this is the most common way you see it. It starts with a, an M dash, then the thing that's being said, um, and that's all that's needed in French. On the other hand, um, French people are used to this. I'm not French myself. I can read this, but I notice that Often I have to read this twice because I'm not quite sure if that third part of the sentence actually belongs to the spoken text or to what the, the author is saying. So sometimes there's a bit of confusion here. Maybe this is not as logical as it should be. Um, you may also see it like this. This is much less common with the guillemets, but the same principle. It doesn't show you where the, uh, where the text opens and closes. But still, this is something that's very common. People are used to it, so probably you should stick to it still. Um, maybe over time this changes. Maybe we can teach people to be more logical and maybe do it a bit more like the, the American way, where they use quotes also to close the first part of the citation and open the second part, so you know without ambiguity where each part starts. On the other hand, this is not quite logical either, because that first comma there, you see the comma after but, doesn't actually belong to the quoted sentence, it belongs to the, the overall sentence, the outer sentence. But for aesthetic reasons, uh, typographers in, in, the, in the US decided it looks better to have it inside. And of course, people are used to that, nobody has any problem with that, um, at least in America. This is another way, um, less common, double quotes, um, same rules apply, it's just using double quotes instead of single ones. Um, I'm not saying this because I'm Dutch, but I think actually the Dutch rules are more logical. Um, I have to say the British rules are the same, so I put US English there on purpose because the British English do it like the Dutch. It's a recommended way to put the comma outside the quote. So now it's completely logical, uh, at least as far as that first part is concerned. The quotes delimit the parts that are spoken, and the punctuation belongs to the part that it belongs to, to the sentence where the comma is needed. Um, actually, this is not quite logical either, because if you look at the end of the sentence, there's a, a full stop there. That full stop is correct, it belongs to the inner sentence. But a normal sentence ends with a full stop itself as well, so you would expect a second full stop there, and it's not there. And that's because, again, for aesthetic reasons, people decided uh, over the ages 
uh, that it was better to leave that one off. People will understand anyway that the sentence ends there. Uh, these quotes you see are the same as the US uh, quotes. Uh, that's actually fairly recent in, in Dutch style. Uh, the traditional style uses these double quotes, low commas and high commas. But uh, since maybe, I don't know exactly, maybe about a century or so, over the last century at least, uh, typographers have decided, well, that's too much. That's, uh, it's not necessary to take up so much space. The single quotes are enough. So let's take, borrow them from, from America, but keep the logical rules. So now you've seen this. So this is how you write a text when you have a dialogue. The question is, how does this work in HTML? Now, looking at the most logical of these rules, you would maybe think, well, let's do it this way. Paragraph, open quotes, uh, the first part of the quoted sentence, then the part of the outer sentence, and uh, another Q element uh, for the second part of the sentence. That works uh, for, the, for the Dutch text indeed, but uh, for the English text, the comma is in the wrong place. How do you get the comma inside the quotes. Uh, CSS doesn't have rules for that, at least not now. Maybe it should have. Maybe we can think of how to do it this way, a logical way, logical markup with aesthetic uh, style. And of course, for the French, this doesn't work either. Maybe you can invent some very complicated selectors to put a dash at the start, but not in the middle. But still, it is not optimal. So maybe just for now, uh, forget about the semantic markup and do it by hand, type everything by hand, and uh, at least it will be readable. Um, another example. Uh, again about punctuation, but in a different role. The punctuation here at the end, you see an exclamation mark. This is again uh, English, American English style. The exclamation mark is very close to the word. There's no space between the word and uh, the punctuation. And then that means when the word is in italics, the punctuation should be in italics too. Uh, because otherwise it would overlap or it looks ugly at least when the, you have a vertical exclamation mark against uh, a cursive uh, word. So even though the exclamation mark logically belongs to the sentence, not to that emphasized word, it's put in italics. In, uh, in French you don't have that problem actually because in, f in France uh, people still put a space before the exclamation mark and also before the semicolon and the colon and the, uh, the question mark. Uh, most languages, most Latin script-based languages used to do that, uh, but most of them don't, no, no longer do it. French still has it. And it avoids that problem of having to put the exclamation mark in, in italics. Um, on the other hand, the French don't put a space before the comma. The comma is so small that it should be against the preceding word. Same for the, the period. It should be against the word without a space. And then the comma and the dot should be italic as well. Of course, for such small things, you don't notice that. So if it's not in italics, but uh, officially it should be in italics also. So how do you mark that up? Well. First markup, the logical markup, the dog is emphasized, exclamation mark doesn't belong to that phrase, so it's outside, but that doesn't work for the English example. So you probably have to mark it up like that. Unless, indeed, as I said before, we can invent something to make this happen automatically, where you just have to set a property somewhere that says, do it the American way or do it the French way. Maybe we can get that there someday. So, that's the question, do you mark it up logically uh, and take the lack of aesthetics for granted or uh, do you mark it up the way it's supposed to be styled? Um, and maybe in the future we'll, uh, we'll improve that. And if we improve it, maybe we can go even further than that. Maybe just, not just the examples that I showed you, but maybe other things that could also be done automatically. Uh, somebody already mentioned, I think it was Daniel Glassman who mentioned uh, LaTeX, uh, the other formatting system that's much more sophisticated than CSS in, in many ways. And there actually it has a property, a single declaration that switches um, 
some of these things on and off. Um, so maybe we can get there. Um, one other example. So, so far you've seen things that you could do by typing the right sequence of characters by hand, forgetting about the semantics, typing the quote marks yourself in the right place, putting the punctuation where it's supposed to be, uh, and not bothering about the, the lack of semantics. So it's possible to get the right uh, styling, even though CSS isn't maybe powerful enough. But this example is different. This example is how you style indexes. So back of the book indexes, alphabetic index. Um, there's lots of interesting things you can say about indexes. Um, I just want to concentrate on that first line there. Um, so the index, it has, of course, page numbers. This is an example from a book. I actually, it's from, a, no, I didn't bring the book, but uh, it's from an actual book. I just copied it. I didn't invent it myself. Um, and when you look at that book, you see that that first term there uh, occurs on two pages, but it occurs multiple times on those pages. So actually, the index should have been something like 142, 143, 143, 143, because it occurs three times on the second page. A good uh, typographer will not write index like that, but not write repeating text there. It looks ugly, it's redundant, you don't have to know that the same page says three occurrences. You can see that when you open the page. Um, of course, those page numbers are only known after you've actually printed the book or after you've laid it out, or if it's an e-book, after you've done the formatting. And the formatting dep depends on the style, on the page size, etc. So the, the page numbers you won't know at the time you're typing the book in. So they have to be filled in by some machinery afterwards. Uh, some placeholder has to be there that's filled in afterwards. We have proposals for that in CSS. There is uh, modules uh, with proposed uh, properties have actually been implemented in some, some programs already. And that's what uh, allows many books nowadays to be styled with CSS. If you buy a novel nowadays from one of the big publishers like Achette, uh, Pearson, uh, etc., they do most of their books with CSS nowadays. It may not be obvious because what you get is just the paper, but actually behind the scenes they use XML, XHTML, uh, and CSS. And they can do the page numbers thanks to these extensions that are not official yet, but we're working on them. Um, but that's not enough for this. The extensions we have allow you to su su uh, replace a page number, uh, a placeholder by a page number. But they don't do this collapsing of multiple numbers. They won't suppress page numbers that are the same as the previous page number. And they won't certainly not create a range. So if you have a number of page numbers in an increasing sequence, they won't replace the sequence by a dashed uh, range like is in this first line here. Now, this is actually doable by machines. We have proof of that because uh, XSL, the other formatting language, uh, can do this. But XSL isn't used, well, it's used a lot actually, but it's decreasing because CSS is getting more and more popular. So the question is, should we copy this from XSL into CSS? Um, I know some people are asking for that, especially publishers, big publishers are asking for that when they publish a book, either on paper or on, in an in e book, uh, on, a, on an e book reader. They want to do things like this. So they're asking for these features. The question is, of course, how do we do that? Can we make it simple? Uh, some people suggest that maybe we should not make a property for that, but expose some DOM, some, some object model for that, so people can write algorithms, their own algorithm for making indexes. Um, so use some JavaScript. Some of these formatters, some of these programs that create books actually do JavaScript. Not all of them do. So there is some problems with JavaScript, but maybe this is a way. But maybe we can also invent, like XSL did, a declarative way of doing this. So that's a question. I don't know the answer yet, um, but the reason I'm here is asking you to tell me what is the best way forward. I hope I uh, inspired you a bit um, to apply these traditional rules 
these are just three of them. There's a whole book full of those. And if you look at this book, especially, I don't know how many pages it had, but it has, but it's hundreds of pages of rules like this and similar ones. And it's good to apply them. The uh, question is how do we apply them in the best way and how do we move forward, making it easier to apply them. So that's my question to you and I hope after the talk you can uh, come to me and tell me or send me email or whatever. Or as Daniel already said in an earlier talk, uh, come to the style mailing list and tell us there uh, what we should do. And that's it.